Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> All right. Good morning. Boy, if you don't get here five minutes early, you usually miss a lovely performance. This morning was particularly... I loved that when it shifted to the minor key. Yeah, that was gorgeous. Um, so, I, I guess, John, should I tell my joke? I think you should. Okay, all right. It only works today. Uh, what comes after the benediction? All of those who forgot to change their clocks. So, so. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You can find me on TikTok. Uh, the Lord be with you. Uh, thank you for your prayers this morning. Several of you have indicated that you were praying for me in the bad weather. It was uh, nasty. A lot of rain on the mountain and fog. Um, though the very tip of the mountain was no fog, so there must be a ring of fog around the mountain. And, uh, but uh, I always slow it down and uh, take my time to get here. Almost hit a fox this morning. So. Anyway, uh, it is good, Lord, to be here. Uh, it is uh, always uh, a wonderful thing to worship. Is there, I, no one has come to me with any announcements this morning oh. until now. Okay. Come, on, come on up. That's going to be a tough act to follow, isn't it? Good morning. I want to draw your attention to page 16 of the bulletin for two things. One announcement that's there and one announcement that isn't there. So let's start with the one that's not there. The uh, GSLC men's group is going to meet this Thursday, the 16th, here in the fellowship hall at 9 o'clock. At 9.30, we're going to go ahead and carpool over to the Georgia History or the Gainesville History Museum, take a tour there. That's going to be followed up roughly at 12 o'clock with lunch at Kelly's Tavern. So the only, uh, everyone is welcome to, to come to that, get a hold of either me or uh, Doug Fugge or Paul Clarkson. The most important thing is if you're going to be joining us for lunch, please let one of us know so we can get the correct number over to the restaurant before we're there. Uh, the second uh, announcement is a little bit more official. Uh, it's the one on the bottom of the page there, special meeting of the voters assembly. Our congregation must take official action to designate a lay voter to cast its vote for the LCMS president in the synodical election to be held on June 17, 2023, and if necessary, the runoff elections to be held June 24th through July 11th. In that we do not have a pastor called to our congregation at this time, we do not have the normal two votes allocated to each congregation. To take official action to determine which layperson will cast our congregation's vote, a special meeting of the voters will be held at 9.45 a.m. Sunday, March 19th, 2023, in the Fellowship Hall. Nominations for a qualified voter willing to serve in this capacity should be made by email to GLS, I'm sorry, gslcsecretary at gmail.com to the church office not later than noon, Thursday, March 16th. Only those voters present at the Sunday meeting may cast a vote to designate a lay voter for the LCMS president election. That's submitted by Doug Fugge. Thank you. Good morning. April the 2nd, Palm Sunday, the LWML is having a bake shop that starts at 9 a.m. And these will be special baked items. Um, this is a fundraiser. The last fall bake sale that we had 
the LWML raised over $1,000 with those bake sale items, and that funded the list of missions for the local community. Um, I'm not going to go through all of those with you because I've done that before, but we are going to post a list in the Narthex of all of the missions that we funded um, for the 2023 year. So April the 2nd, come and buy bake sale items because they'll be great for the whole week leading up to Easter. And then about Easter, on Easter morning, we will have a brunch. It will begin serving at 9 a.m. And we will serve until 10.15. I have just put a sign-up sheet in the information hallway um, for breakfast sides and um, sweets, things of that nature. The fellowship committee will be providing uh, with donated eggs, which as anyone who has shopped for eggs, that's a big donation uh, for all of the scrambled eggs. And we'll have bacon and sausage from the fellowship committee. And then we're asking for sides like hash brown casseroles and uh, things of that nature. So we're going to eat a lot. And then we can start exercising. Thank you very much. In addition, there is also a sign-up sheet for if you are planning on coming to the brunch or not. We just want to get a good idea of how many people will attend. Uh, if you think you might come, but it's kind of iffy, go ahead and put your name down. Let's stand and praise the Lord.
We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart, and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment, but I am heartily sorry for them. I sincerely repent of them. I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God to all of you, and in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. The Lord be with you. We pray, Almighty God, look on the humble desires of your servants and stretch forth the right hand of your majesty and be our defense. This we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, who is our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. The Old Testament lesson this morning is from Exodus 17. All the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages, according to the commandment of the Lord, and camped at Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the quarreling of the people of Israel, and because they tested the Lord by saying, Is the Lord among us or not? This is the word of the Lord. We will read Psalm 95 responsively by half verse. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. For the Lord is a great God. In his hands are the depths of the earth. The sea is his, for he made it. 
O come, let us worship and bow down. For he is our God. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our epistle today is from Romans chapter 5. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Congregation, would please rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel this morning comes to us from St. John, the fourth chapter. So, Jesus came to a town of Samaria called Sychar. It's near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour, that is noon. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? Because Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. So Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well. He drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty forever. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you're right in saying I have no husband, for you've had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. So what you've said is true. The woman said to Jesus, sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you, that's you plural, so you all say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here. When the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit. Those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. And when he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. This is the gospel of the Lord. We confess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth and of all things, visible and invisible. 
and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man. And he was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours in God the Father and in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Word of God that engages us in meditation as it's printed in your bulletin there is the reading from Romans, especially the first verse and to some extent the second verse. We're justified by faith. And because of this, in verse 2, we therefore have access to God. So that's the subject of the sermon this morning. I'm going to teach you what Paul means when he says we are justified by faith. But the way I'm going to teach you is I'm going to rely on the gospel reading. So we're going to talk about the woman at the well, okay? So let's dive right into that. Uh, in order to understand how the narrative of what Jesus engage, how Jesus engages this Samaritan woman, in order to understand how that teaches in narrative form what St. Paul is teaching in systematic form, I want you to understand a little bit more perhaps about the history of the Samaritans than maybe you've ever studied before. Some of you probably have, and so this will be a surprise to you, uh, or won't be a surprise to you, but some of you haven't. So uh, the first thing I'm going to say, and I'm going to watch your faces to see how many of you are surprised by this, Samaritans are Jews. Mm -hmm. Okay, I saw a few couple surprises, so that's good. Let me explain. In order to understand who the Samaritans are, we have to, well, there's a clue actually in the text. Do you see where they live? They live near the field that, Joseph gave, that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. In fact, right near that field is Jacob's well. Now, who's Jacob? He's Israel, right? The father of the twelve. And who's Joseph? His favorite son. So just let that sink in a little bit when you realize that the Samaritans are the people who are occupying the land that was given by Jacob, by Israel, to his very, very favorite boy. Now that's the first little piece in the puzzle. How many of you also know that Jacob was technically only the father of 10 of the tribes, 10 of the 12 tribes. That's right, because Joseph is actually the father of two of the tribes. Now, how does, you're trying to do the math. You know that Jacob had 12 sons, right? You know that Joseph was one of them. Well, Joseph had two sons, Issachar, and, or Ishmael and uh, Manasseh, those two sons became two of the 12 tribes. So now we should be dealing with 13 tribes, right? If you're doing the math, except that the Levites did not get any parcel of land. 
Okay, so now you figure out where all the, where all the, the uh, tribes are and what have you. But when the, when the land is being divided up late in the book of Exodus um, and then uh, it, later in, in the uh, end of uh, the book of Joshua, when the land is being divided up and the parcels are being uh, oriented, uh, Joseph's two sons each receive a parcel of land. So they are two of the twelve. Now that means that is, uh, that Ishmael and Manasseh are already sort of like lower ranking brothers, if you will, among the twelve. They're already kind of looked down upon. But what else can you remember about the history between Joseph and his eleven brothers? I start saying Joseph, and the first thing that's maybe coming to some of your minds is, oh, the guy with the multicolored coat who was sold into slavery by his brothers, effectively killed off, is really the way, the way it worked out. As far as Jacob was concerned, they, his his son Joseph had been killed by wild animals. He was gone, sold into slavery, actually sold to Ishmaelites, which if you're really tracking the history, are sort of like half-cousins. They are uh, Joseph's grandfather's brother's descendants, and uh, that's who ends up buying Joseph and carting him off to slavery in Egypt. Anyway, uh, you've got conflict as ancient conflict between Joseph and uh, the other brothers, which is as ancient as Israel itself, okay? Now, when the land was being parceled out, the, those two sons of Joseph, Ishmael and Manasseh, were given lands kind of far in the northern region of the promised land. Or lands around Galilee, land that... Jacob had promised to his son Joseph. Makes sense? Joseph's sons received that parcel. So uh, the, the land where these Samaritans are living is the ancient lands belonging to the tribe of Issachar. Now, a little more history. Let's fast forward now to, not to David, but to, not to his son Solomon, but to Solomon's son Rehoboam. Now, Rehoboam, uh, and under Rehoboam, the kingdom divides. Solomon was the last king of a united tr 12 tribes. But it's really Solomon's fault that the kingdom divides, and here's why. Solomon enslaved the northern tribes. He literally conscripted them into slave labor to help build his city in Jerusalem. And uh, so it was it's a, like a pretty terrible thing, right? That the, the, the king of Israel in Jerusalem, he didn't enslave the other territory. He enslaved the, the Israelites, but especially the northern tribes. And he placed over the northern tribe, the, over those conscripted slaves, he placed a man by the name of Jeroboam. Jeroboam was from the tribe of Ishmael. So maybe Solomon did that on purpose because there's tension between Ishmael and the other tribes. Maybe he did that on purpose. But Jeroboam was smart and he used that position to his advantage. And he must have treated those slaves very, very well because when Solomon died and his son Rehoboam took over, the, all of those northern tribes, especially those slaves, they asked Jeroboam to go talk to Rehoboam and beg Rehoboam to stop the policy of slave labor that had, that had so plagued the northern tribes. Now understand, Solomon and Rehoboam, these are Judahites. These are southern, what we would think of as southern tribes. Of course, there is no north and south yet, but it's about to happen. Because Jeroboam goes to the new king, Rehoboam, and says, uh, there's really no justification for our people to be enslaved. <laughs> we're, we're, we're brothers. So, uh, you know, let's, can we work on this thing? Can we work out a solution? Rehoboam lies to Jeroboam. And without going into detail, what results is a divide that the northern 
tribes end up rallying around Jeroboam as their, as their primary political influence, their king, and the southern tribes remain lo- loyal to Rehoboam primarily because he is in the line of David. Okay, are you with me so far? It's a lot of history, but trust me, I wouldn't go into it if it weren't important. Now you've got uh, the northern tribes under Jeroboam. Well, that lasted for a hundred and some years until um, actually a guy by the name of Zimri becomes king, also an Ishmaelite. But uh, seven days after Zimri becomes king, uh, and uh, um, a member of the tribe of Issachar, a guy by the name of Omri, uh, performs a coup d'etat. And Zimri is out after a, 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 a one week in office. He's killed. And now the Ishmaelite who was the Ishmaelite line who had occupied the, the kingship of the northern territories was out. So Ishmael is now out and Issachar is now in. So now not only are the, and if we're tracking the Ishmaelites, now not only have they been severed from Jerusalem and the Davidic line by the conflict between Rehoboam and Jeroboam, now they've been separated from the northern kingdom because their guy got killed killed by the guy from Issachar. Now, 150, 160 years later, the Assyrians attack. And when the Assyrians attack the northern kingdom of Israel, they, you know, they, they pretty much run, they run all over them. I mean, it was a no contest thing, right? And they start carting off and, and dispersing all of the northern tribes except for the Issacharites, who had no loyalty to Ishmael or any of the other northern tribes, they end up making a deal with the Assyrians, and the Ishmaelites are allowed to stay on their land. So the Ishmaelites, even though the rest of the northern kingdoms are now just gone, dispersed, It's the Ishmaelites that remain on their native land where they were, what they had inherited from the very beginning. And um, when, okay, then fast forwarding a little bit more, now uh, the southern kingdom falls and now everyone is being sent back, right, under the the Persian king Darius. And uh, now I'm into the the book of Ezra and Nehemiah with you on your history. Um, The the Israelites are permitted to come back and begin to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. And um, uh, when they come back and those Ishmaelites are still living up in that region, by that time, the Ishmaelites have sort of lost their identity as Jews. They're, they have uh, assumed the identity as Samaritans from Samaria, and the conflicts continue. In fact, if you read in Ezra chapter 3 and 4, especially in chapter 4 of Ezra, you'll see there's conflict there between the the Samaritans, the Ishmaelites, and the the rest of the Jews, and they're not permitted to have anything to do with the temple. Now fast forward to Jesus. Jesus, when he journeys into Samaria, he's not journeying into a foreign territory. He's journeying into the historic lands of Joseph and Jacob and Ishmael and Manasseh. He's journeying into the most despised and uh, cast off members of the tribes of Israel. The most marginalized of Jews. So marginalized they don't even regard themselves as Jews anymore. And as it says in the text, the Jews have no dealings at all with Samaritans. Well, that's been going on for a long, long time, since before they were called Samaritans, right? And, uh, And he goes in there and he meets this woman. So the woman at the well that Jesus meets has grown up in a culture that has been cast off by the culture of Jerusalem. Even though they, and if you run into a 
a, a Jew today who cl lays claim to Samaritan heritage, they will tell you they're the true Jews. This t the, the mo I'm talking about modern day. You've, you meet a modern day Jew who traces his lineage back through the Samaritans. He, that, that person believes they're the true Israel because they're the ones that remained on their land. They're not the ones that ended up in Babylon, etc., etc., etc. Anyway, um, you run into this woman at the well, and she has grown up in a situation where her entire life, her entire culture, her people, her, her entire experience is that she's been cut off from the temple in Jerusalem. Now, what's the temple in Jerusalem for? Well, that's one of the things we've been studying over there in the Bible class. Um, basically, what we understand, the, t the tabernacle and the temple was God's way of granting his people access to himself. Okay? The temple was the place where the sacrifices were made. What were the sacrifices made for? <laughs> Forgiveness of sins. God granting access to his holiness, to, th to his people. The temple was the place for the priesthood. What was the priesthood for? Well, the priesthood was to make appeal to God on behalf of the people. So the temple in Jerusalem was the geographical location where in the first century mindset, whether you're a Jew or a Samaritan, the temple was the place where you gained access to God. Now, at some point in all of that history, probably somewhere around the time of the rebuilding of the, uh, of the temple in Jerusalem, uh, somewhere in that, re in that area, the Samaritans said, well, fine, if you're not going to let us into Jerusalem, we're going to make our own temple. No problem. We got, we got it covered. And so by, by the time Jesus shows up in Samaria, a Samaritan is as Jewish in her religion, in her concept of who God is. She's, no wonder she's expecting the Messiah. She's been expecting it since Jacob. Right? So uh, the only problem is, of course, they've had to figure out a way to do it on their own. which is a problem we all have. Trying to figure out access to God. And in the midst of us trying to figure out how, we, how it is that we might have access to God, we get all kinds of confused by politics, by religious tradition, by cultural identity, or even closer to home, for this woman, uh, sometimes our biggest concern about access to God is the sin in our life. And when Jesus runs into this woman, so not only has she been ostracized from the temple and the community of faith as far as they were concerned, but she's also ha she also has her own personal problems with sin that she knows also will block her access to God. Now, Jesus shows up and he starts interacting with this woman. Trust me, I'll get back to Paul eventually. Jesus shows up, starts interacting with this woman, and uh, very quickly, I mean, the, the, you see how the, the, little, the conflict unfolds at first, culturally and politically. Well, she's a Samaritan, he's a Jew. Jews have no dealings with Samaritans, and they really had no dealings with Samaritans. They didn't have business dealings, they didn't have political dealings, they didn't have religious dealings, they certainly didn't have romantic dealings. And here's Jesus showing up at a well. You know what happens when single men show up and sing with single women at wells in the Bible. It's like every single time. There's going to be a marriage sooner or later. And here's Jesus showing up, a single guy, and here's this woman, and technically she's not married either. Um, and she's wondering, what in the world is going on here? And... Um, 
Jesus moves the conversation from the political, religious, and cultural problems right to the sin problems. And when he does that, when he says, oh, you know, it's true that you don't have a husband, you've had five husbands, and the guy you're living with right now isn't your husband, and that's a problem. Um, He's telling her things that only a prophet could know. And she immediately discerns this. Sir, it's become rather obvious based on you telling me something that there's no way you should know. It's pretty obvious that you're a prophet. And so all of a sudden... So, and when you read that in the text, when she says, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet, I want you to read that full stop. Because what happens next is her entire experience of that encounter is brand new. All of a sudden, she's not dealing anymore with a random Jew who's creating a little bit of conflict by interacting with her. Now she's dealing with a prophet of God. And she gets right to the heart of the question that's been plaguing her for a thousand years. How may I have access to God? It comes out in a question. Well, sir, we Samaritans, we... We worship God in the temple here. You Jews, and that's why when I was reading it, I wanted you to hear that that's plural. You, when she says you say that the proper way to worship is in Jerusalem, she's not saying you Jesus say that. She's saying you Jews say that. So she immediately gets to the point of the conflict. I'm a Samaritan. You're a, you're a Jew. The Jews have their temple. We have our temple. The problem is I need to know that I have access to God. So what am I supposed to do? And if you're worried about your access to God, which Paul says, if you have it, you have peace. So where there's no peace, there's anxiety about access to God. Can you track that in your life? Where there's a lack of peace in your life, there's an anxiety about your access to God. And Jesus says, Oh, it's access to God that you're interested in? Hey, I got good news for you. Here I am. I who speak to you am He. She's like, she's already told him, by the time he says that, she's already told him that her faith. Her, not her religious practice. Her, her religious practice is one of the things that's causing her to have anxiety about access to God. Am I worshiping in the right temple or do I really need to try and figure out how to you know, get to the temple in Jerusalem where they're not going to let me in? Um, but she does have faith in the promise that the Messiah will come. So, when she shows that she has faith that the Messiah will come for her, she's in, access to God is immediately opened. Hey, you got me. I'm right here. You have access to God because Jesus Christ is in your presence. Let me say that again. It's tr- I'm, I'm saying that to her and I'm saying it to you. You have access to God because Jesus Christ is in your presence. So that means that if you're, if you're, um, if the thing that's interrupting peace in your life, 
is some concern that is related to, oh, I don't know, a religious practice or, I don't know, cultural situation. Maybe it's a, a matter, some kind of matter of life and death that's causing you a, 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 the kind of anxiety that robs you of peace. Maybe it's a sin. Maybe it's a set of sins. Maybe it's a constant recurring kind of sin. Something in your life is interrupting the peace of God which surpasses understanding which Paul says you have through faith because you've been justified by faith. Justification is access to God. He says it in those first two verses. And so if the woman at the well, if, if all of those peace-destroying problems that she and her people have been dealing with for a millennia, if, a millennium, if, if all of those are in, instantly crushed by the presence of God, because Jesus has come into her life, Jesus shows up in Samaria, she doesn't find him in the temple, Jesus comes to the well, he's exhausted by the way, which should teach us the most important thing of all in this lesson, and that is every single blessing that you will ever receive from God comes to you through the suffering of Jesus Christ as it came to her. And all of a sudden, through her faith in the promise of the Messiah, she has access to God. She is... Paul might say, justified by faith. Now, why do I say, now, okay, so there's the story of the woman at the well. I hope you learned a thing or two about about, uh, that story that you maybe hadn't heard before this morning. Um, uh, Goodness knows you never connected Omri and uh, the Samaritan woman. (laughs) Um, So, uh, back to Paul. Justification means that you have a record, yourself, a record that validates your presence in the heavenly realms. Your your record. Now, none of us, the Samaritan woman, does not have a validating record. Her record is invalidating. Her record invalidates her by uh, by uh, history. It invalidates her by culture. It invalidates her. She's not even worshiping at the right temple. So it invalidates her by religion. It invalidates her by her sin. Her even her fear invalidates her record. But because Jesus has come to her, and because Jesus has justified her her with his presence, she's justified by faith. She now has uh, nothing that she has earned. She has a validating performance record that has opened up her access to God. What I just said about her is true about you. Whatever it is that's interrupting your peace with God, Remember that Jesus has come to you in spite of or maybe because of the very thing that you think is cutting off your access to God. And because Jesus has come to you and because you then trust in his presence, because you trust in his credentials, because you know that he died on the cross to forgive you, because you know that when God looks at Jesus, he's well pleased, and because you know that when God looks at you, he sees Jesus, because you're in Jesus, you therefore are justified by your faith in Jesus Christ, and because you're justified by faith, you have access to God. And as Paul will then go on to say in that paragraph, that's what gives you peace, that's what gives you hope, that's what gives you patience, that's what gives you endurance, and none of that disappoints. If you continue to read the story of the woman, the very next thing she does is run around and tell everybody what's just happened to her. I want you to do your own inventory. I want you to 
to try and see yourself in that woman's story. I want you to try and identify those things in your life. Sometimes they're thought patterns. Sometimes they're passions of the heart. Maybe they're kind of physical addictions. Um, Maybe they're just faulty traditions. I want you to identify those things in your life that you think are blocking your access to God, interrupting your peace with him, causing you to have less hope, causing you to have less patience, less endurance, causing you to have more disappointment. All the things Paul talks about. I want you to identify those things. Just as we've identified them in the life of the woman in Samaria. And I want you to see that your story is no different than hers. Jesus came to you. Paul says it, while we were still sinners, Christ died for you. And because he has done that for you, and because you have laid your faith on his death and resurrection, folks, you're justified by faith. And you have access to the God of all creation. Amen. Please stand as we pray. Heavenly Father, without the suffering and sacrifice of your Son, Jesus, we'd never have access to you, but we are justified by the faith that you have given to us in him. And so we come to you now in prayer. We give you thanks for seeing each one of us as we truly are and loving us anyway. Thank you for forgiving our petty politics, our ridiculous religiosity, our secret sins, and our destructive doubts. Help us to tell our story of your love, Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, we offer our prayers on behalf of those who have no relationship with you, those who've rejected the free access that you've granted by faith in your Son. 
Send your Holy Spirit into their lives, bringing them the good news of justification by faith. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, we ask you to make us good citizens of Georgia, good citizens of the United States of America. Help us to know when to speak and when to remain silent. Help our leaders to discern truth from lies. Give them courage to uphold that distinction as long as they serve the public. Grant them wisdom and save them by your Son. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, you've made known to us the needs of so many, especially as we list them in our prayer list. So to that end, we beg you, heal the sick, encourage the homebound, comfort those who grieve. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Finally, into your hands, we commend those for whom we pray, always trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Savior, who teaches us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence. Holy Spirit from me, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Amen. We thank you for joining us online this morning. I certainly encourage you to share this service if you're watching us on Facebook. Uh, We're more than pleased to have our message go out to the world. Um, And we also invite you to join us here any Sunday morning you desire, or if you have any questions, to contact us at our office. The Lord be with you.